So we are continuing our lecture on uh, the pathologies for the patellofemoral joint. This is an extension of the forefront of the lecture where we talked about patellofemoral joint anatomy um, and also arthrokinematics and osteokinematics that occur at this specific joint. So about 50% of patients who report to an orthopedic physician's office with knee pain, um, about 50% of those patients report with anterior knee pain of some sort. And so the category that um, orthopedic physicians have given this anterior knee pain um, is what we call patellofemoral pain, right? Um, and so what I've done for the rest of this lecture is broken up the categories in which patellofemoral pain syndrome can be broken down into. Um, and I believe that it allows us to um, treat this pathology a little bit more efficiently, and it also allows us to assess it easier. So uh, category number one would be uh, patellofemoral pain with some type of malalignment, right? So that's a maltracking issue at the patella or with the patella itself when the patient is, is moving. Um, then you have patellofemoral instability. And then category number three would be patellofemoral um, pain without a malalignment. And then last but not least would be probably the most obvious of the four categories, which would be patellofemoral pain um, syndrome that arises as a result of some type of traumatic um, incident or mechanism of, of injury. The first group of pathologies that we'll talk about um, when we're referencing the patellofemoral joint and pain um, are those subset of individuals that will present with um, anterior knee pain um, that is as a result of um, a malalignment. So when we think about what the etiology is, typically it's a malalignment of the patella um, within the actual trochlear groove of the femur itself. Um, and so typically you either have tight quadriceps, whether that be the vastus medialis medially or the vastus lateralis laterally, um, and then those tight muscles um, play a major role in patellar tracking um, and or gliding in the um, inferior superior direction. So the quadriceps could also play a role in how the patellar tracks with, within that groove. So what is the pathology behind this? This particular subset of individuals. Well, the first thing that we know is that when patellar tracking is altered, um, the first thing that happens is you have this increase in compressive forces on the patella, right? And so if that patella is gliding more laterally, typically you have increased compressive forces on that lateral side of the patella, which could essentially lead to um, chondromalacia patella on that side of, of the patella. Um, what we know about this um, pathology as it relates to malalignment is that typically you see malalignment that occurs somewhere within the kinetic chain. Typically it starts with the pelvis, so um, either the, pa the patient will present with an increased Q angle or a decreased Q angle. And remember we said um, for our males, the normative value for a Q angle would be about 13 degrees, um, and then for our females, it'd be about 17 degrees um, plus or minus one, right? And so that if, in fact, we have an increase in our, our Q angle, that typically leads to genuvalgum at the knee, um, which could essentially lead to hyperpronation at the foot. And then on the opposite side of that, if we have decreased uh, Q angle, that could lead to genuvarum at the hip, um, which could lead to increased supination supination forces at, at the foot. So we can see how one joint um, or set of bones could lead to alterations either up or down um, the kinetic chain. So in fact, like the the song says, my foot bone's connected to my knee bone, my knee bone's connected to my hip bone, they're all really truly connected structures. And when you have a malalignment somewhere within the patellofemoral joint, um, I guess it's not surprising that a patient could present with anterior knee pain. So what are the signs and the symptoms associated with someone who has um, patellofemoral joint pain um, due to malalignment? Um, well, the number one sign and symptom that they typically report with is pain descending the stairs. And then they also complain um, of pain when sitting for a prolonged period of time. So we could kind of take uh, you sitting in my classroom, for example, and then we could say that you are as soon as you get up to leave that after that hour and 20 minutes period of sitting, that when you get up, you would have sharp shooting pain in the anterior aspect of the knee. In addition to that, they also have popping and clicking. But remember, we said that popping and clicking is not 
um, a true telltale sign because you could also have popping and clicking with a meniscal tear, um, an osteochondral defect. So we don't want that to be our only sign and symptom that we look for in patients with anterior knee pain when they have a malalignment. Um, some of these patients might also present with swelling in the peripatellar region or the most anterior portion of the patella. And also what we see with these individuals um, is that reduced great toe extension um, during gait. And essentially what, what that means is they're not really getting good toe off, um, which means that they're putting the, the forces that would be transmitted up the foot are actually being transmitted directly to, to the knee joint, which means more increased load on the knee and also you probably have more um, exacerbations of the signs and symptoms if forces are going directly to the knee and not reaching the foot. So more force is being applied to the knee, which equals more anterior knee pain in this subset of patients. So as a clinician, if I have a patient who comes in with anterior knee pain and we think the sole source of their problem is a malalignment issue, several ways to, to treat that pathology, right? Number one, if it occurs at the foot, then we could say, okay, maybe they're, they're, um, we could get them some orthotics. If it's occurring at the knee joint, then we could say, okay, well, maybe we could do some rehab. Uh, and then if it's at the pelvis, what we really have to figure out is uh, leg length discrepancies um, and whether or not they are true or anatomical, right? So we really have to figure out what the cause of the malalignment is and then directly try to fix that source. So the second subgroup of uh, patellofemoral pain pathologies has to do with the development of this pathology due to um, what we would call instability. Um, and typically that the instability can be created in one of two ways. Uh, it could be something that's subtle that just develops over time that's as a result of microtrauma, or it could be as a result of a traumatic um, onset of injury, which we'll talk about in another category. So I'm going to spend most of my time on this slide talking about the subtle um, different ways that we could develop instability at the patellofemoral joint. So typically what we what we would say about these individuals or this subgroup of individual is it's usually um, as a result of laxity in the static restraints. So our static restraints lose their abilities to really truly keep that patella in the trochlear groove, um, lose the ability to provide restraint to the patella when we receive lateral or medially directed blows uh, to the patella itself. Um, and more than likely, 9.9 .9 times out of 10, what we tend to see in patellofemoral st instability is that it is a weakness of the medial sta static restraints. Um, specifically, remember we talked about that medial um, patellofemoral ligament, which plays a huge role in uh, medial stabilization of the knee. And remember, it provides about 60% of the static restraint in the patellofemoral joint. So anytime we have laxity to this particular ligament, we, there's a huge concern because the patient probably will develop um, some sort of patellofemoral instability and will present with signs and symptoms that were very similar to the first category of groups. So pain um, going down downstairs, um, definitely pain on the anterior aspect of the knee with um, some swelling potentially and maybe some clicking and popping as well. So how do these individuals develop instability? Well, these uh, individuals typically have some type of predisposition to instability, right? I mean, kind of think about the ACL in the knee when they say that, you know, females are more predisposed to ACL injuries because of their hormones. Well, individuals who develop a patellofemoral instability typically have either a hypomobile medial restraint, um, so or they have a tight lateral structures, right? So it, what we see is that on one side of the knee or the other, the structures are tight, and as a result, they kind of pull on that patella, and they cause kind of, in essence, a malalignment at the knee. Um, by causing that malalignment, what they're doing is they're creating excessive pull on that static restraint, um, and that creates a laxity about the static restraint and indirectly leads to instability of the knee. Um, what we know um, in so a small subset of individuals um, is that they're born with shallow trochlea, um, and if we think about the role of the trochlea, it really truly is to allow that patella to glide in the trochlea. So the trochlea groove has to be really deep in order to receive both the medial and lateral facets of the patella. And when it's shallow, what we see is that those individuals are more susceptible to knee su or patellar subluxations uh, and patellar dislocations, giving rise to uh, secondarily to instability. So we really want that groove to be deep 
so that patella can sit in there. Um, these individuals, as I said, will present with similar signs and symptoms to those individuals who have a malalignment issue. Um, and so treatment for these particular individuals might actually be a little different. Surgically speaking, we might have to go in um, and repair the medial or lateral static restraints um, with some other tissue uh, within the, the human body. Um, or it might just be as simple as strengthening the dynamic restraint. So the V, the vastus medialis uh, medially, and then the vastus lateralis laterally, also maybe the glute med um, and the tensor fasciae as well. So we just want to restore that dynamic restraint so that we take some of the pressure off of the static restraints um, of the knee. So on the traumatic side of uh, patellofemoral instability, the first uh, pathology that we really want to discuss is a patellar dislocation. Um, you know, unless it's a, a complete fracture, then the most traumatic uh, type of pathology that we would really see at the patellofemoral joint definitely is, is a dislocation of the patella. Um, and in 90% of the cases, the, the patella is going to dislocate laterally, meaning we're going to stretch um, all of the medial restraints. So what's the mechanism of injury? Typically, it is a direct contact to the medial aspect of the knee, specifically um, the medial border um, of, of the patella. So right here, so um, patient takes contact and then that patella subluxes laterally. Um, and when it subluxes, um, it stretches all of the medial restraints, specifically the medial um, patellofemoral ligament, um, and also you could get the synovial plica as well. Um, one unusual mechanism of injury is when the tibia is in external rotation, um, and then the quadriceps kind of contract forcefully um, to bring that tibial, tibia back into a neutral position. Uh, when this occurs, if the quadriceps contraction is forceful enough, it could also cause um, dislocation of the patella. But most commonly, at least, um, in athletic training and in physical therapy, the mechanism of action or injury is going to be definitely direct contact to the medial side of the knee. So with the patellar dislocation, um, as you can tell in this bottom uh, picture here, what you see is the patella definitely has glided laterally. Um, and so what you would, would suspect is, number one, if the vastus medialis has some fibers that insert on, on the patella itself, um, then what you would expect is that the patient, if the dislocation is severe enough, would um, strain that distal portion of the vastus medialis, uh, would definitely uh, rupture and or tear the medial patella retinaculum, um, but also the medial, medial patella femoral ligament, um, that if, if the dislocation is catastrophic enough that they would have what we call heme arthrosis or blood in the joint, um, and that if, in fact, you encounter this, really simply, if you just have your patient say, why don't you just go ahead and straighten your leg out, what you will see the patella do is um, slide inferiorly and then back into the trochlear groove of, of the patella, or of the uh, um, the patella will slide back into the trochlear groove. I've actually had one of these, um, and it's it's really awesome. What you what you see is um, the vastus lateralis really really starts to contract to, as a protective protective mechanism um, and your patient will be screaming in pain and again if you just subtly just pull that foot out so that the knee goes into extension this kind of pathology will reduce itself now I'm saying this for a patellar dislocation but also we know to never ever reduce a actual full knee dislocation so how do we diagnose uh, patellar dislocation well obviously um, if we're staring at a, dis a, a dislocated patella and it hasn't um, reduced itself, then obviously it's to our eye, we should be able to see that the patella is probably going to be laterally deviated. Uh, but there are other ways within our um, clinical expertise that we can go ahead and assess for a patellar dislocation. One of those is to assess for um, patellar hypermobility, um, and that's done with a basically a lateral gliding of the patella. So you can tell the clinician takes his or her two thumbs, places it on the medial border of the patella, and then gently just tries to glide that patella, that patella laterally. This is called an apprehension test, and what you are looking for is not how far the patella glides, but at the patient's face to see if in fact they get apprehensive, hence the name apprehension test. Um, other diagnostic tools that you could use um, to rule out maybe a fracturing of the posterior side of the patella and or a rupturing of the medial restraints would be an x-ray and or um, an MRI as well. 
So treatment for a patellar dislocation, typically and from the initial time of dislocation for about seven days, the knee is going to be locked in extension. Um, and the reason that physicians lock the knee in extension is truly just a protective mechanism. Remember patellofemoral arthrokinematics, that as the knee uh, goes from extension to flexion, that patella is gliding superiorly. Um, and so the reason they lock that knee into extension is truly just to stabilize that patella so that it can't pull medially, laterally, superiorly, or inferiorly. Um, and this gives the um, static restraint structures time to kind of heal down, um, to tighten back up, kind of like they do in an ankle sprain model. Um, if after seven days of being locked in knee extension with the knee brace, the patient is still effused at the joint line, then the physician will go in and aspirate. Um, and, and this is done really truly just to decrease the amount of pain the patient is in. Um, but it also helps to increase um, range of motion at the knee so that you can start range of motion exercises with your patient. Typically with the patellar dislocation, surgery is not recommended unless they've really truly have torn all of the medial restraints of the knee. Then the physician will go in and kind of repair the medial patellofemoral ligament because again it provides about 60% of the restraint on the medial aspect of the knee but no normally treatment is really truly just conservative so they're locked in knee extension they'll have some crutches and then we'll protect it rest it ice it compress it um, and elevate it as much as possible and then once our patient has regained range of motion is fully weight bearing really want to focus on strengthening the dynamic restraints of the knee, specifically the medial knee, since most of the static restraints will have been stretched um, and lax. And so the dynamic structures, the vastus medialis specifically, really is going to take over, um, and then also maybe even potentially the adductor muscle group as well. So, so far we've talked about two different groups. We talked about patellofemoral pain um, with a malalignment, and then we've talked about patellofemoral pain that arises from some sort of instability, and that instability could be something very subtle in nature, um, like laxity um, of the static restraints, um, or it could be something that occurs as a result of a traumatic pathology such as a, a patellar dislocation. Um, to, right now, what we're going to talk about in this third category are patients who present to you with anterior knee pain, um, and when you assess them, they have no malalignment, no mm -hmm. maltracking whatsoever. They really don't have a, a history of anything that was traumatic. And so this next category of patients that we are going to be discussing are the patellofemoral pain patients that present to you without a malalignment. In the category of patellofemoral pain without malalignment, you we basically have around four pathologies um, that we could kind of group these typical patients into. Um, so the first category that we could say is um, patellofemoral tendinopathies. So that would be your, your tendinitis um, and or your tendinosis or tendinosis. Um, we have apophysitis, which is typically we see that in our younger um, population as they are growing quickly. Um, and then we also have uh, a bursitis, which tends to be traumatic in nature. And then last but not least, um, the synovial plica, which we touched on in the beginning of, of this PowerPoint lecture. So we think about a tendinopathy. What we're saying is that um, it's some type of inflammatory condition um, or degeneration of, of the patellar tendon specifically, right? When we think about the patellar tendon, what we're saying is, is this is the tendon that's going to attach the inferior pole of the patella to the, the tibial tuberosity, right? Um, and when we see a patellar tendonitis, typically we see that where it occurs in the mid-substance of, of the patellar tendon. And your patient in this particular case would really present with signs and symptoms of um, increased pain with activity, right? Um, decreased pain following activity most often than not. They might have some crepitus when um, you flex and extend the knee and they're definitely going to have a thickening of, of that tendon as you palpate it and compare it to the other side. If the clinician does not recognize the tendonitis or the inflammatory condition that's occurring within the tendon and they allow that patient to continue to, to participate in sport, what we tend to see is that the patient will develop what we call a, a tendinosis, right? And, and a tendinosis is probably the most severe case of a tendinopathy. Um, and this is where you actually have the wearing away or the degeneration of the actual patellar tendon itself. Um, and if the patient does not rest, then basically they're set up for a patellar tendon rupture. And so you might say, well, what is the difference between a, tendinop or a tendinosis and a tendinitis, right? A tendinosis 
pain is constant. Um, they have lots of crepitus, thickening of the tendon, and they might even have a little bit of a palpable defect because some of the fibers of the patellar tendon are starting to wear away. So um, if you have a patient who presents to you with these signs and symptoms, the only true way to differentiate between a tendonitis, which is an inflammatory response to the actual tendon itself, and tendinosis, which is actually wearing away of the actual tendon, you would have to get um, an MRI. So if we're not thinking tendinopathy and we rule that out, then the next thing that we want to assess for is an apophysitis, right? So inflammation of the apophysis, right? And typically we see this in our younger patients. So if we have, you know, a young high school athlete or a middle school athlete who's presenting to us with anterior knee pain, this is really where we want to focus in and hone our um, evaluation want to rule out apophysitis. And typically, the two forms of apophysitis that we see in the anterior knee are um, Osgood Slaughter's disease, which you guys know a lot about, and then Sinden um, Larson Johansson's disease, which is kind of um, is similar to Osgood Slaughter's disease, just the location at which it's occurring. So we'll talk about those on, on separate slides. We ruled out apophysitis, we ruled out um, the actual patellar tendon itself. The only two things or anatomical structures that are left on the knee that could potentially elicit anterior knee pain would be a patellofemoral bursitis um, and then the synovial plica, which is lies medially and has a little bit of an attachment to the medial meniscus as well. So we're going to talk about all of these pathologies independently. So the first pathology that we'll talk about with patellofemoral pain syndrome and no malalignment issue is Oscar Slaughter's disease. It is an apophyseal pathology. Um, typically, we see Oscar Slaughter's disease in patients who have um, this increased rapid strength growth of, of the quadriceps muscle. Um, and as a result, that quadriceps muscle group, its hypercontraction continually places pull um, on the distal portion of, of the patellar tendon as it attaches to the tibial tuberosity. And over time with microtrauma or microtrauma after macrotrauma, what you see is that the fibers um, of the patellar tendon start to pull away from the tibial tuberosity. Um, and then you also get like an exostosis where you see that bony outgrowth of, of the tibial tuberosity in most patients with this particular disease. The other time that you see um, Oshkid Slaughter's disease in a younger patient population is in those, those kiddos who just happened to be 13 and had a complete growth spurt. Um, and that, that patellar tendon is placed in a lengthened position and just can't keep up with the massive growth that's occurring within that, that young kiddo. So what happens is as they're starting to sprout up, that patellar tendon starts to get stretched and it starts to have its fibrous attachments pull away from the tibial tuberosity as as well. Um, Oshkid Slaughter's disease is a very painful condition um, in most cases, specifically when we look at it in the younger population, it's very tender, tender to about patient at the tibial tuberosity. Um, and some patients equate it to if they bump their knee, they say they just feel very nauseous, they have to fall to the to the ground because it's such debilitating um, such a debilitating pain. So how do we treat um, and or manage these patients? Well, number one, the biggest thing is to reduce the amount of stressors that are being applied to the tendon, specifically to the tendinous attachment, which is the tibial tuberosity. And so a lot of what we can do is work on, work, work on strengthening the hamstring muscle group, which is the antagonistic muscles to the quadriceps, um, and then work on stretching um, the, the quadriceps and doing uh, patellar tendon mobs, right? So that we can kind of take some of the slack off of the patellar tendon through the actual quadriceps themselves. If you notice distally, that your patient does have an exostosis of, of the tibial tuberosity um, and has an inflammatory response, then we want to control that inflammation. And one way to do that um, is with NSAIDs. Uh, you can do cortisone injections as well, but most of the time, your typical oral NSAIDs should do the trick. So if nothing else works, so strengthening oral NSAIDs, 
stretching, joint mobs, if nothing else works, um, in extreme cases where the pulling and the tearing away of the patellar tendon from the tuberosity becomes too much for the patient, or they evolve that patellar tendon off of the tibial tuberosity, the physician will go in, um, specifically in a case where there's exostosis and actually surgically excise uh, some of that bone and then tack down um, the distal portion of the patellar tendon. Um, and I'm not sure what the outcomes are of this surgery, but what we do know is that once the bone's been excised and once that patellar tendon's been replaced or placed, tacked back down, patients report less pain. Um, but again, that's just fixing the symptom. What we have to do is truly figure out what the cause is. And typically the cause is a, a strong quadriceps muscle group or a dominant quadriceps muscle group that isn't getting any relief from the antagonistic muscle group in the hamstring. So a lot of it's going to be strengthening that hamstring muscle group, like I said before, um, and maybe increasing flexibility of, of the quadriceps muscle group. So we hear a lot about Oshkid Slaughter's disease. Um, and so the brother or the sister to Oshkid Slaughter's disease is Sinden Larson Johansson's disease. Um, and this is caused again by a shortened quadriceps group um, and more so caused by a lot of repetitive jumping and or, or running. And we see this a lot in our track and field athletes who are doing a lot of the skipping and the bounding and they're very young in age and the apophysis hasn't quite closed. In Oshkid Slaughter's disease, what you see is the patellar tendon pulling away from the tibial tuberosity right here. But in Sinden Larson's Johansson, what you see is one of two things. Either the patellar tendon starts to pull away from the inferior pole of the patella. So we can see right here there's a fracture site there, and you get what you get an avulsion fracture. Or sometimes you can have the quadriceps muscle pulling away from the superior pole um, of the patella. But most often in a Sinden Larson Johansson disease, you're going to see the inferior pole um, being avulsed with the superior, most superior portion of the patellar tendon. We see this most often in males, um, and that's because they tend to do a lot of jumping and bounding and plyometric techniques early on in age, and so you tend to see Sinden Larson Johansson's most often in the male population. So what do we do for these patients? Similar to what we would do for someone with Oshkosh Slaughter's disease, which is to reduce um, the activity or to remove them until they are pain free, um, until the fracture heals if they have a fracture, um, and then just to really treat them with what we call palliative ther therapy, which is basically just anything that does not cause them pain. So more on the traumatic side of a patient who presents to you with anterior knee pain um, is, is bursitis. Um, and as the name implies, bursitis is an itis, so it's an inflammatory condition that occurs to a bursa within the knee. Typically, uh, the most common bursa that's going to be injured um, at the patellofemoral joint is probably the suprapatellar bursa. Um, and so when we think about bursitis and how it's caused, it's, it's usually a traumatic blow to the anterior aspect of the knee. Um, that could occur with direct contact. It could occur from falling onto the knee directly. Um, and then you can also get a uh, fat pad irritation as, as well. Um, so if it's not traumatic in nature, other things that could cause um, bursitis would be repeated low intensity blows. And so the number one sport that I think of um, when I think of low intensity blows would be volleyball, right? Where they're digging for the ball or sliding on two knees to, to dig the ball. Um, that would be the case where you would you would get repeated blows. And then in overuse, I'm thinking of the catcher who's always in a um, in a squat position who drops down to his knees to maybe get a ball from, from the gutter. And then um, last but not least, we think about infection. Um, we're, we're talking a post-op infection where um, the physician um, has completed the surgery and maybe uh, potentially has irritated the bursa. And so after the surgery, the, the swelling goes down. However, the knee still effused. Um, it could be that the bursa is just irritated and infected from some type of surgical procedure. And so in that case, you would just use antibiotics and typically that does does the trick. So what do we do for someone with, with bursitis? Um, the biggest thing is protecting um, the bursa. So you don't always have to remove the patient from activity as it says here. Um, but the big thing is, is if their range of motion is limited, if they can't um, produce the movements that they need to be successful in the sport, then always, always, always remove them from the activity. Otherwise, my recommendation is to pad them using a donut hole. So you would do something like this, where the bursa would really sit in the center of this hole right here so that all the force, if the if 
the knee does come into contact with another structure, it would be distributed around the donut hole itself. And last but not least, we want to control for inflammation. So oral NSAIDs first, and if those don't succeed, then sometimes physicians will go in and inject with, with cortisone. All in all, this isn't one of those pathologies that is going to make you pull an athlete from participation for the rest of the season. You just have to get it under control. So the synovial plica, um, specifically the medial synovial plica, I'll spend a little time here because a lot of you were um, interested in it during during the lecture. And so what's known about the synovial plica is is this. It's, it's an embryological structure um, that is formed within the knee. Specifically, we're going to talk about the medial plica because that's the one that's most often injured. Um, and so it's going to it's going to form on the medial aspect of the knee. It's very thin, it's soft, and it's it's flexible and it moves with the knee specifically during knee flexion and, and extension. Um, and so this structure, specifically the medial plica, can become impinged as the knee moves from knee flexion into knee extension um, and vice versa. And if it becomes impinged, um, then it creates uh, a, a, an inflammation about the knee. Um, what's interesting about the medial, um, the medial plica is that uh, it's one of the most common sources of knee pain. Um, and research shows that about 50% of patients reporting to um, an orthopedic physician's office with anterior knee pain, in 50% of those patients, it's typically the synovial plica that's, that's irritated. So what's What's the etiology of, of this pathology and how does it occur? Well, no one really knows what causes or causes the exacerbation or irritation of the medial synovial plica. So it's it, the onset is insidious. It's just random. The patient will present to you to, in the clinic with no true mechanism of injury. They won't be able to explain what happened. They won't be able to describe it. So we say that the onset for this pathology truly is insidious in nature. Um, what we think the etiology is, is this idea that the medial synovial plica um, attaches to the medial um, femoral condyle, um, and you can kind of see that structure right here, the medial femoral condyle, um, and then has an anterior attachment to the medial meniscus right down here. So it has two different uh, anatomical attachments, and what they think happens is as that knee moves from flexion into extension and vice versa, that that plica really rubs against the medial femoral condyle um, and in some cases at the end range of extension can become impinged. So who is really set up to suffer from a plica syndrome? Typically those patients that have a really thick plica or a really large plica um, or have had a history of osteoarthritis where that medial femoral condyle is worn away um, and that that plica can just rub on that bone and trigger those pain fibers to send pain uh, pain impulses up to the brain. So signs and symptoms, um, they present very similarly to um, a meniscus uh, in nature or a lateral IT band syndrome. It's going to be very difficult to, to kind of rule this out. So clicking, popping, um, and then anterior knee pain. All generalized signs and symptoms, right? So clicking and popping, we said that could be with a patellar malalignment issue, that could be with a meniscal tear, that could also be with an osteochondral defect. So really it's all about the location um, of the pain. And so if we're looking at the patella um, in this particular picture, in the plica and its insertion, what we will see is that really truly a patient with a medial plica syndrome will present with pain on the most superior medial border of, of the patella. And that's truly the differential between someone with a synovial plica and a meniscus who, when you have a meniscal pain patient, remember that pain is strictly going to be most often not right in the joint line. So I guess I kind of got ahead of myself, right? Um, so what are the implications in the knee? So um, if you have lost elasticity or if, for example, that vastus medialis is really, really tight and causing a, a maltracking of the patella, um, it can also cause impingement of the synovial plica. Um, or if you have chronic disturbances in the knee, so specifically if you have someone who has knee instability, so that second category, and they're constantly subluxing their patella, um, that could also cause irritation of the synovial plica. So how do we assess it? 
what are the differentials? I've already mentioned um, the meniscus, right? So we're going to rule out meniscus. Um, we're going to rule out patellar subluxation because remember, a synovial plica can become impinged if the patient is subluxing that knee or it can become stretched and inflamed if that patient is subluxing laterally. Um, and then last but not least would be someone who has a patellar maltracking issue. So patellar malalignment. Uh, if that patella is tracking more medially, meaning the vastus medialis is pulling that patella medial, medially, then what you will see is as that patella glides medially and that knee moves into extension, you would be pinching or compressing that plica, in essence, causing it to get in, inflamed. The last category of, of conditions um, are traumatic conditions, right? We've talked about patella um, femoral pain syndrome with malalignment. We've talked about patellofemoral pain syndrome caused by um, some type of instability about the knee, specifically probably a dislocation. Then we've talked about patellofemoral pain syndrome without a malalignment. And those are the patients who either have tendinopathies, some type of apophyseal um, issues, right? They could have a synovial plica or and or a bursitis. And now what we're really going to talk about are probably the most obvious conditions that would cause a patient to present to you with anterior knee pain. And that would be something that is traumatic in nature see is that in this fracture the false joint is going to occur right here right so you're palpating 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 and then nothing 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 so then you see the false joint occurring so what could cause the patella to fracture well nothing other than an absolute direct blow to the knee to the anterior aspect of the knee or it could also be um, a, a tight quadriceps uh, mechanism that's pulling so forcefully and has so is causing so much traction between the superior pole of the patella and the inferior pole and as a result you get you get also get a patellar fracture the last sign and symptom that you would see would be pain over the fracture site right and i mean that for me as a clinician if they take a direct blow to the anterior knee and uh, just a contusion alone right would cause pain so of course there would be pain over the fracture site so be careful when you're assessing these patients. Um, if you see the false joint, um, if it's visible to the human eye, there's really no need to palpate the fracture site. I would just splint them and then refer them on um, to a physician to get uh, to get repair. And what they'll do um, in this case is they'll actually do like a surgical meshing where they'll apply a mesh um, over the patella and then they'll suture or um, I guess suture that bone back together and then the patient will be locked in a knee extension brace for about four weeks or so. Blows to the knee making that patella more fragile, more weak, um, then of course you would be more susceptible to suffering from a patellar fracture. So what are the signs and the symptoms? Um, well the number one sign is what we call a false joint. So if I so next on the list of traumatic conditions would be a patellar tendon rupture, um, and this is always acute in nature. However, a person could be predisposed to a patellar tendon rupture, but most always and often um, the onset of a patellar tendon um, rupture is, is acute, and typically this occurs again just kind of like a patellar fracture. There's this dynamic overloading of the, extens the extensor mechanism, and by this what I mean is you see this a lot in um, your Olympic weightlifters, specifically as they're going into their squat. Um, they're loading lots of weight, and as they go into the squat position, pulling that bar up and then loading it down as they flex their knees, you tend to see the quadriceps uh, or the extensor mechanism get overloaded from the weight and then boom, snap goes uh, the patellar tendon. With that being said, it doesn't always have to occur dynamically. It does not always have to be a forceful quadriceps contraction. There are other ways um, that patients are predisposed to a, a patellar tendon rupture. Um, the number one way would be a tendon degeneration, which we would know it as a tendinosis, right? So someone who's had a tendinitis that's developed into a tendinosis, which is a degeneration of the tendon, they just simply come down from a rebound and that, that patellar tendon, again, it ruptures because there aren't as many strong fibers intact. Another way um, that we see patellar tendon ruptures, typically you see this more so 
um, in your competitive sports, your professional sports, um, would be the repeated cortisone injections. What people understand is that a cortisone injection is a good thing, right? You inject cortisone with the idea that it's an anti-inflammatory, it's going to reduce inflammation. But one of the um, scariest things about a cortisone injection, if they're given too close together, if too many are given in a, a given year, that you can actually cause a weakening of the actual tendon itself and you could predispose a patient to to tendinous rupture, right? And so that just isn't um, focal to the, the patellofemoral joint. That's all tendons in general. So the recommendation for cortisone injections is a year is in a year is no more than uh, three times um, in a year, and that's to protect the patient. So what are the signs and symptoms of a patellar ru tendon rupture? Well, um, probably gross deformity, right? Depending on where that patellar tendon ruptured from, it could rupture from the inferior pole of the patella, it could rupture from the attachment site on the tibial tuberos tuberosity, at which point in time you're going to be looking for either patella alta um, or patella baja, right? So, so so in this case, when we're talking about patella alta or baja, um, a person who ruptures their patellar tendon would present to you with patella alta. However, a person who uh, ruptures their quadriceps tendon would present to you with, with patella baja, right? Because they would have no restraint to move in the inferior direction. And so again, patella alta would be associated with a pure patellar tendon rupture, and then patella baja would be associated with a uh, quadriceps tendon rupture, which we could have either tendinous rupture occur if we're overloading uh, the, the quadriceps extensor mechanism. So just want to draw that to your attention. And then of course, if there's a rupture, um, depending on at which site, whether that be the superior pole, if it's the quadriceps tendon or the inferior pole, if it's the patellar tendon, they would have tendinous to palpation over that area of, of the patella itself. So just like in the ankle, we had the ankle Ottawa rules. Um, I'm going to give you the um, Ottawa knee rules. And I'm not sure if this is in your textbook or not, but I got this from, from a research article. Um, and, and what the Ottawa knee rules are, um, are a set of rules that are used to identify patients who should be referred for an x-ray after uh, an acute note underlying all caps trauma. So this isn't something that's been is micro trauma after micro trauma. This is an acute blow to the anterior aspect of the knee. So for my physical therapist or physician, assistance in the room anyone who's over the age of 55 and took a blow or a traumatic had a traumatic incident occurred to the knee has tenderness to palpation over the fibular head um, so that's the lateral aspect of the leg has has palpable isolated tenderness on the papel on the patella so that could be the anterior portion of the patella it could be medial lateral inferior pole or superior pole has the inability to flex their knee to 90 degrees. Um, the reason they say that is because more than likely there's swelling or a, a knee joint effusion. Um, so we need to figure out what's causing that. And then they're unable to bear weight for for four steps immediately following the trauma. So that's they get up off of the ground and you ask them to take a few steps. And if they can't take more than four, then we're referring. All of these must be in place. Check, check, and check in order to refer for an x-ray. And what they're saying is that if they don't have all four or five of, of these checks, then more than likely they probably do not have a fracture of, of the patella, right? So we've ruled that out. Now we just have to go back to the drawing board and figure out which category does our patient fall into, right? Is it patellofemoral pain with a malalignment? Is it patellofemoral pain with instability? Is it patellofemoral pain with without malalignment? Or is it last but not least some traumatic condition or episode that occurred to the actual patellofemoral joint? That is the end of the lecture. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it, and I'm so sorry that I couldn't get through this entire um, lecture in class, but I'm actually glad that I got to do this because I got to go more in depth over, over the pathologies. Please remember we will have an exam on, on Wednesday. I hope you had a wonderful Easter with your family um, and safe travels Monday, which would be tomorrow. Um, I will see you guys Wednesday at 8 a.m. I uh, hope you enjoyed listening to this lecture. As always, I would love the feedback. Thank you so much for your time.